Good day to you. Thank you for tuning in to the podcast. It's another day. Sunshine here. Oh my gosh, I've got so much stuff to talk about. Oh boy, I'm full. I'm full, I'm full of of topics, of thoughts, of questions. And, and I'm just going to be honest, this is going to have to be the conclusion of the Power of Preparation series. Not because there's no more content, but just because... I could never include everything within this concept, within this idea. I have at least five pages that I never even got to of scriptural preparation that that I would like to say we'll just revisit. Just verse after verse after verse, account after account of how the people of God were a people of preparation. We even read two nights ago, um, before bed with my son, we were reading the end of David's life, and he's talking to Solomon. And of course, David, we know, he wanted to build the temple. He, He wanted to do that before the end of his life. He wanted to be the one to build the house of God, a very a very great desire and, and and plan. So much so that he had assembled many materials. I think it's in Second Chronicles where we were reading. I don't remember. And again, I'm driving. But he, he had he had assembled like more metal than could be weighed. And timbers. He had made preparations for something. And there's something within that for me, and I will even add that in light of what I've been sharing in measure here in these recordings and much more so in my life. Just with individuals in my life. And my wife and I, of course, just our constant exchanges about what we're doing, what's ahead of us what the Lord is calling us to, and and again, as I have shared here, in a public form, just the rearranging of the plans I have made, the preparations I've made for my son. And there's so there's when I read that, I, I made some notes in my journal, like, I've got to come back to that. About the spiritual reality, and even in the natural the, the preparations that David made that he, because of his preparation, because of what he was, him, what he himself was going towards, I'm going to build the house of the Lord. And of course, Yahweh God tells him, no, you're not. You're not going to do that. That's not going to be you. And so everything he had prepared to carry out now, to build a house, (laughs) to build a dwelling for Yahweh, he could not fulfill, but he gave it to his son. In light of this study, we could say, David looked to Solomon, he said, son, I've been preparing a house for the Lord. I've been making preparations, I've gathered the materials to build a house For Yahweh God to come down and indwell beside men. Son, do it. Fulfill it. I have made a way for you to do this. I have prepared what's necessary for you to pick up the task and bring it into reality. And of course we know Solomon in fact did that. I said that Months ago, when I was reading something about all of the requirements of the, of the building, the blueprints, you know, God's blueprints for his house and the precision within it of just, like, when that was completed, I just want to touch on this again. 
because I, I think it would do us good to think about these things. When that was completed, when the first natural dwelling of God on natural earth was finished, and God's glory and His presence filled the temple. Oh man, y'all. Holy cow. What an awesome depiction of our now reality on this side of of Yahweh coming in flesh as, as Emmanuel, tabernacling with men, no longer in a temple tabernacle made with materials, but in a form of a man that was from his seed placed within a woman. Deity meeting humanity. Why? To set up a a tent, a tabernacle, to be with men. And to become the perfect dwelling for eternal God to be found the, the dwelling was deemed fitting and right. Why? Because of the denied self. The denied will. The not my will, but yours. On earth as it is in heaven. Yahweh God, for the very first time in history now, post-fall, found an acceptable dwelling in flesh. The God-man. And of course... As we always talk about, this was a mere pattern for us to follow. Jesus, I'm not lessening anything that he was or that he did and that he accomplished and fulfilled, but he was simply a pattern for you and for me and for every other man who would willingly do likewise in his path, in his way, and present ourselves to the way, the truth. The life. He made a way. He prepared. And this is what, man, I shared this with a brother last week. And it's like, man, I just got to sit down and and give it more meditation of my heart and thinking towards it. Because, man, this is what I mean, like, about being full. I I feel like I could just spend a couple days with this recording um, going and, and just not even come close to covering all the things I feel that the Lord is revealing in this hour. I need to give myself more. I need to give myself more. Uh, What? I don't even know where to go. But the reality of just God indwelling man. Okay, so he, forerunner Messiah, Jesus Christ... He came to prepare the way for every other man who would do as he has done in his strength, in his power, in his literal likeness. He prepared the way for us. John the Baptist prepared the way for the Messiah to come. And so now here we are doing both. We are now walking in the way that was prepared for us as we prepare ourselves in sanctification, consecration, a set-apart holy people, denying sin, denying self, hating what is evil, being men of righteousness with clean hands and pure hearts, a continuing contrite position, we prepare ourselves. We present ourselves as a living sacrifice that is acceptable to God Through the Son, the perfect slain Lamb, the propitiation reality of the slain Lamb who went before us, that our identity has got to be in Him or we cannot be in the perfect, holy, righteous presence of Yahweh God. That's why it has to be no longer I that live. Just as we are in the likeness of his death, we are in the likeness of his resurrection. Newness of life. And we now, as those men preparing ourselves, prepare the way 
as John the Baptist for the return, the fulfillment of the Messiah, the the returning to receive his bride, to get his reward. And y'all, I'm telling you, I thought of this the other day. Here's another offshoot, and I'm just going to, I'm going to walk 10 feet and I'm going to come back. But y'all, this is where I'm at presently with all of my opposition of the rapture. And man's fascination with getting removed from tribulation, trial, testing. Just get me out. And of course, mankind is bent on avoiding tribulation. And so surely... God has not appointed a man to wrath. Okay, well, (laughs) he's not appointed us to wrath, no. But he has surely given us to trial, tribulation, testing. We have to know what we're talking about. And the outplay of the culmination of the ages. What an honor. The scripture talks about it being an honor. To bear that alongside the Messiah. He did not do all that he did so that we do not endure trials. Because most most Christians that I know that are very serious and like not just topically religious make it their bumper sticker to say it's the ones who endure to the end that will be saved. Okay, well, most of those people also embrace the teaching and doctrine of the rapture. How in the world can you separate those two? I believe wholeheartedly I have to endure to the end to be saved. But get me out of here because I will not endure anything. Because if I had to endure something, God is not good. Friends, this is hypocrisy. It doesn't make any sense. It's it's just confusion. We have been called. You know, this is the thing, right? Does not the Spirit of God within a man empower him and enable him through the dunamis power of God to be an overcomer in the midst of trial, tribulation? Oh, man. I want, I read a book years ago called I Want to Be Left Behind. I remember I walked into a McDonald's 10 years ago with that book I was reading. And the manager said, hey, man, what you reading? And I showed him the title. He said, he was so, I mean, y'all, he was offended. He said, what, are you joking? He spoke from the position of a Christian. Are you joking? That's heretical. Why in the world would you want to be left behind? The world's going to be a mess, friend. And we had this very, very brief, but like instantly heated dialogue because he could not even give himself to think that it's possible about what if I have to endure something? What if I have to be tested and tried? and endure persecution and tribulation, heresy, heresy. God would never allow that to happen. (laughs) Silly. Juvenile. We must prepare to endure. We must prepare the way for the Messiah. Y'all, okay, so like John the Baptist, Yohanan the Immerser, he was the forerunner to the forerunner. He came and he declared the way in preparation. He said, I am here. It's not me. It's not me. Stop looking to me. I'm not the Messiah, y'all. Stop it. He's coming, though. He's coming. As I said the other day, he's right over that hill. He's going to come get in this water any time now. He's coming. He's coming. And when he came, he was recognized. It's the reality. The out, it's, the, it's the evidence of the parables of Jesus. John the Baptist recognized the return. It was not a thief in the night reality for him. In in that case, return, the, the origination of Messiah, the outset of Messiah, the arrival of Messiah, part one, if you will. John the Baptist saw him, boom, Messiah, this is the man. I have been talking about, he's the one the scriptures have de- has declared is coming. He's here. He's here. Look at him. He is the one. He is our Messiah. It wasn't a thief. It wasn't a surprise. And friends, do you hear what I'm saying? 
We are in the same. Everything's the same. There's religion. There's pagan celebration. There's debauchery. There's the God of men is their bellies. Babylon is here and it's 50 states. Y'all, we live in the same, same, same world. But Messiah is coming. Messiah is coming, and I'm telling you, the verse about even the most elect will be led astray, they can be led astray. Y'all, if we're not careful, we ourselves will go the way of the world. We will go the way of the world. Do you hear what I'm saying? You are not immune. I am not immune to falling asleep, and the Messiah comes as a thief. And we're surprised. We're caught off guard. We have no oil in our lamps. We're not ready to go out and meet him at all. He had to come, and I didn't even know it. Y'all, that can be us. That will be many who are convinced that he's coming to swoop them out into the sky and set them down in Beulah land and give them cake and ice cream, and he's not going to come that way. What happened to John the Baptist? What happened to him? Was he raptured out with Jesus? Did Jesus reveal himself as Messiah and say, Well done, John. Let's get out of here. Shoof! Off they went into the sky. His head was cut off with a sword and put on a platter to be carried across the land and presented as a gift, y'all, Do we understand that? I mean, really. Do you think about that, the follow me call? Do you think of it in such a way? Do you prepare yourself for that being possible for you? Or are you a good American Christian? We're celebrating Christmas. We're decorated. We're pretty. We're made up. We're perfumed. We're going to the finest restaurants, eating the finest food. We're giving gifts. We're shining up our cars. We're going to events, and we're watching great entertainment, and we're celebrating the birth of the Messiah. And John the Baptist's head was brought on a platter. Friends, do we see the striking contrast of how we respond to the Messiah? And how those who went before us who said, I will follow him. What was the end of the disciples? Accolades? Blessing? Oh, it's just God's blessing. God gave them nice houses. Set them up in predominant places of work. Made them leaders. Death. Literal, physical death, torture, beatings. I'm asking you, friend, are you so devoted to the pronunciation of the coming Messiah to be able to in any way respond to that rightly as a true follower of Yeshua Messiah? I literally ask myself that with regularity. Am I so committed That should that be what comes for me, that I will stand, and I will stand, and I will stand again. And I will not deny him. I will not turn away. I will declare he is coming, period. Do what you want. I am a blade of grass. I have abandoned my will. I joined in with his death. If I join in the likeness of his death, I will also join in with the likeness of his resurrection. It is not limited to being circumstantial. If we are a people that has prepared ourselves for such a life and such a death, such a sacrificial life. I'm telling you, friend, the stuff that I've been writing right now in regards to our holiday celebration I don't know who's going to listen. It's going to be tough. It's hard. It's offensive. It gets right in your face, and I'm just telling you right now, you better start preparing your heart if you're going to listen to it because you will probably hate what I will say. 
It will oppose everything we enjoy, everything we want to do, everything that we have convinced ourselves is right, good, and celebratory because if we just squint our eyes hard enough, it's about the Messiah, it's about the Messiah, it's about the Messiah. The sale at the mall, it's really about the Messiah. Keep Christ in Christmas. It's all about Jesus, the greatest gift. It's not about me wanting all of that. That's hogwash, y'all. It's hogwash. That's, that's what's next on the table. Plus, I've already got a three-part series that I recorded two days ago that's got to get online. What is the Spirit saying? What's the Spirit saying to you, friend? Days, weeks, months, and years are flying by, and few seem to know what the Spirit's saying in this hour. Preparation. 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 I'm going to try to bring this to a close right here. When I did part one of this series, I talked to pretty elaborate lengths about some scenarios that just came to mind as I turned the recorder on in light of painting the picture of how everything we do in our life we prepare for. I talked. To, I, I used an example of sending your children off to school. And y'all, there's, there's endless examples of how we as humanity now are a people of preparation. Just in the natural. Forget spiritual condition, forget spiritual purposes and endeavors. I just mean as humanity, as mere men, we are a people who plan every single thing we do and we prepare every single thing we put our hands to. In some way or another, there's been a preparation involved. Everything. So as, as people prepare now, I'm telling you, it's just right on the, it's right on the, the, the tip of every single thought I'm having is this, quote, holiday season that everybody cannot get away from. I, and let me just say this, right? I've been watching a few videos the last couple of days about some opinion about holidays, Christian holidays. And do you understand? You, we need to understand this. I watched an atheist talk with great clarity and like he talk, he made sense, y'all. He made sense. He said, you know, I hear all these Christians talk about how there's such a, quote, war on Christmas. I don't see that at all. I see Christmas bigger than it's ever been throughout all of history. There's no war on Christmas. Are you joking? America alone spends billions and billions of dollars on gift giving, celebrations, food, and lavish living. There's no war on Christmas. Are you joking? It's flourishing. Well, what's the war on then? Oh, well, it's people taking Christ out of Christmas. That's the real war. Oh, gosh. Y'all. Okay, I got to close the door. That's, that's for the next time. I can't, I can't even go there. I wouldn't be able to properly explain uh, my intent behind it. We prepare for so many things. Right now, man, y'all, let's just use this as an example to close the door on the Power of Preparation series. If you celebrate Christmas, which probably every single person who listens to this does, I don't. We don't do that. We've not for years. And I'm telling you, the freedom and clarity of mind and seeing things so much differently than I've ever seen them in my whole life from a spiritual perspective is only because we were willing to give that up. But most people aren't even willing to consider the idea. No way. Uh Uh-uh. Awesome. Well, okay, so you're preparing for that. You're buying gifts. You're going shopping. You're going to the mall. You're wrapping gifts. You're cooking food. You're buying groceries. You're planning trips. You're preparing your heart to celebrate what everybody would just quickly say. Hey, it's all about Jesus now. It's all about Jesus. Okay, let's just... For the sake of not opening that up, okay. All of the preparations and the planning to go into celebrating a man-made holiday. 
I mean, people go to ridiculous lengths, y'all. Spend thousands of dollars. On what? (laughs) A celebration. An emotion. A feeling. A spirit. But friend, if it's really about Jesus, if our lives are really about preparing the way for the Messiah's return, and saying on earth as it is in heaven. What in the world are we doing about that? How much time are we spending on our eternal matters of our heart and the hearts of our family and our brothers and sisters and strangers? Are we giving ourselves with such drive and emotion and want to to the unseen things of the kingdom as we do of these things here in the natural? I'm telling you, I do not see that in the body of Christ. I do not see it. And I look, seriously, I look very hard to find it. At best, it's a 50-50 mixing. It's a mixing of the pagan ways of the world and the ways of Yahweh God. And y'all, this this is just closing the door. We must sit back and ask ourselves, am I preparing myself to prepare the way? What did John the Baptist do? I'm hung up on him. He went out to the wilderness. He wore a camel hair suit and ate bugs and honey. Well, why in the world would he do that? Do you think John was just trying to make a statement and, like, be different? Well, if I just act like a fool, people will come be attracted to me. Are you joking? I remember a picture in my son's illustrated Bible when he was little had a picture of John standing there all scraggly, unshaved, messy, ratty hair, flies flying around him with his hand dipping a grasshopper in a jar of honey. Y'all, that's, that's probably, probably very accurate. There was nothing about him that would be like, hey, I want to hang out with this guy. <laughs> he was probably considered repulsive. Why? Because his life was set apart to declare the coming Messiah. And guess what? He did that. <laughs> He did do that, you know. People were drawn to him because of the things of the Spirit, not because of his natural condition, not because he was relevant, not because he was attractive, not because he was an eloquent speaker, not because he had an awesome book on the bestseller list, not because he was a good preacher and had a great congregation in a nice church. He was despicable. That is how we know it is the message that draws men to us. It is the message of prepare the way that must resonate in the heart of every man. And that alone will draw them to the one declaring the prepare the way message. So friends, do you do that? I'm asking myself now. I have not been doing that. I have not been that man preparing the way in self-denial for Messiah to come. But y'all, he's coming. He's coming. He's coming for a pure and a spotless bride. He's coming for a people who have trimmed their wicks, filled their lamps, and are prepared to go out to meet him. Look, y'all, let me give this picture and then we're going to stop for sure, I promise. This is how I presently see in my imagination, right? Right this second, my imagination sees the the virgins who are prepared. Their lamps are full. Let's just say it's like a village. The village has dim light from candles and lanterns hanging upon small little huts of buildings, little dwellings. There's just a dim orange light 
that kind of goes out into the ground, about 10, 15 feet around the perimeter of this tiny village. And there's two types of women. One is sitting down. Her lamp is empty. The wicks are unprepared. We could say she's doing a number of things. She's she's knitting. She's cleaning up her house. She's reading a book. She is just innocently disinterested. She's not vile. She's not an abhorrent woman who is a sinful, wretched lady. She is just not prepared for what is about to happen. Maybe she was at one time, but she sat down. She, she was tired. I waited. Boy, I waited for months, for, for years. I waited. But you know what? The bridegroom, he's just not coming. I just, I'm, I don't, I'll, maybe I'll try later. He's just not coming. I have things to do. So she's tending to those matters. But at the very edge of this dimly lit village, there's another virgin, y'all. And she's holding her lamp. And it's filled to full. She filled it again at sundown, as she had done every night previous. And her wick is trimmed and ready. And she is at the edge of that very dim light and, and... Inches in front of her is darkness. The woods. It's just nothing out there. It's quiet. It's still. All you hear are crickets chirping. But she's standing there. And she's facing the darkness. And she hears a little crack of a stick in the distance. And she's up on her tiptoes. And she's putting her hand up to her brow. And she's looking. She's looking left and she's looking right. And she's saying, is that the bridegroom? Is that the bridegroom? Oh, maybe, okay. Maybe that wasn't him. So she gets back down flat-footed. And she holds up her lamp. And she's moving her neck around, left and right. And she's looking, she's straining. I don't, do I see something out there? Is that a light out there in the distance? Is that the, the sound of, of my bridegroom coming? She gets up on her tiptoes again and she strains and looks, holds up her lamp out and, and from her arm and an outstretched arm holds it out, lighting up a little bit further. Is that him? I know he's coming. She turns around and she calls her friend and she says... Get up, Martha! He's coming! And Martha yells back, Do you see him? No, I don't see him, but get up, he's coming! He's coming, friend! Put down your knitting, put down your book, and come out here! I know your lamp's not full, I saw you tonight, you didn't fill your lamp, please! Fill your lamp. He's coming. And friends, that's what I'm saying. Get offended. I don't even care. My lamp is full. And I'm saying, is your lamp full? Or are you busy with the cares of life? And are you distracted? And are you waiting? Are you waiting on your understanding? Are you waiting on your doctrines? Are you waiting for the right moment? Are you waiting to not be busy any longer? Are you waiting for some emotion that it's just not going to come? Are you rousing yourself from your slumber and standing there beside another with the lamp full and your wit trimmed saying, it could be tonight. It could be tonight. I'm telling you, friend, 
any one of us could be caught sleeping. And he comes like a thief in the night. And guess what? You missed it. It's possible. So, friend, do you understand? The power of preparation message must go out and it must land upon fertile soil or the whole church is going to be found sleeping. I want to be ready, not for myself. I want to be ready for him to receive what he is due. I want to be ready so that my king can receive his great reward. He is worth it. He's worth it. He is worth me giving up holidays. He's worth me giving up fun, enjoyable things that I would love to do. He's worth it. He's everything or he's nothing. I'm telling you, that's no, that's no t-shirt, friend. He's your everything or he's nothing. The power of preparation. The power of preparation. He is worthy of us preparing ourselves to prepare the way for his return. Amen.